No. It's moving. It's okay. Moving. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Everything is there. Great. Right. Should I start? Yes. Take it away. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I don't know how many of you are there or um, where you are, who you are. You're in Stockholm, I guess. Um, I'm Julian Togelius, and I came here to talk about artificial intelligence and games. I was asked to do a relatively broad um, intro, not presupposing very much. So here we go. Um, so first of all, I'm at New York University and missing the logo. I'm also at a company called Model AI in Copenhagen. Um, that's not where I'm from. So let me start by introducing myself. So I'm originally from Malmö. Um, I was about to say the beautiful city of, but that would be a lie. Um, I finished high school there, um, even though I very nearly um, uh, failed my mathematics classes. Um, and I decided that I wouldn't absolutely never be any kind of engineer or have anything to do with mathematics. I wanted to study philosophy and psychology in Lund so that I could understand the mind. Um, that I did, but then um, to my chagrin, I realized that I had to um, understand, to, I mean, really philosophy and psychology didn't really get me very far. I had to build the minds to, to study them. So I did a master's in Sussex, England, in biological inspired AI and evolutionary robotics. And then I went to Essex in England, um, and I wanted to evolve neural networks to control robots. Um, however, what happened was that I realized that um, robots are really slow and they break down all the time and they're noisy and dirty and stuff like this. So I decided I could do the same thing in video games. Um, and I discovered that, well, you could not only use uh, games to sort of develop AI better, you could also use AI to make games better. And that sort of, these two things became kind of my career throughout. I did a postdoc with Jürgen Schmidhuber in Lugano. Um, I was faculty in, at, the, at the University of Copenhagen for about five years. And now I'm um, at New York University for six and something years. So I do all, all kinds of things in the intersection between AI and games. I care about using video games to make artificial intelligence better. And I care about using um, um, uh, and in, 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 and I care about using artificial intelligence to make games better. So basically, basically both things. So I'm basically going to do a very sort of a quick dip into some of these topics here, and then we can do more Q and A afterwards in um, any language that I speak. It's not that many of them. Um, right. I mentioned artificial intelligence a lot uh, in my intro. What is artificial intelligence? You may, you, you may or may not have taken an artificial intelligence class. I was told that I really shouldn't suppose that you had. So this may seem still be a bit mysterious. Here in the background is Hal from um, the 2001 a Space Adventure, or Space Odyssey, sorry, from 1964. Still one of the best movies ever made. It's a very good depiction of artificial intelligence because we don't understand anything about it. There are lots of definitions of, um, um, of what artificial intelligence is, but the one I like best because it's so dry and boring is making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do, which is what we do in AI. We choose new problems um, and we think that, oh, we don't know how to do this. This is something mysterious that only humans can do. If you can do this, you must certainly be intelligent. And then we sort of work really hard on trying to make a computer do it, and it take a lot of time. Um, and uh, then we come up with a computer program that can sort of do it. And then people look at it and says that, oh, so now you can solve the problem. That means you don't need to be intelligent to solve it. So what do humans do with games? Um, I'm not sure if I can ask questions out in the room and have people answer. Miriam, can people talk back to me? Will I hear them? Say again. Maybe not. What did you um, say? Can, can I ask questions to the room and will people? Yes, you can. Uh, it, it's it's going to be, I can actually show them to you as well. Uh, oh, wow. uh, well, actually, so, no, I can't. I just realized. Oh, so, so, I, I just wanted some input on what do humans do with games? Yes, what do humans do with games? They interact, with 
interact with it is one answer. That's good. That's good. Did anyone say play yet? <laughs> yeah, and one answer is playing games. Exactly. That's usually the first I get. Almost always the first I get. And then, then isn't it interesting how far, how, how, how kind of like diverse the answers get? I guess learning, learning games. Learning games, yes, indeed. Learning to play them, learning to interact with them. Having fun, hopefully. Having fun? Good. I like that. We have one answer here in the audience. Yeah. We also analyze games a lot. Oh, very good. Okay, we get a pretty good sample here. Um, so I usually cluster the, the different answers I get in this. Play them. I get lots of versions of play them. Study them. That's analyze here. It goes into this. I mean, we have all these people who are game studies people who study games like you would literature or something. Um, and learning is a good one. Someone said learning. I will let's fit this into playing now. Um, build the content for them. There's a lot of games where you can build content as a user and sort of share it with others and play it yourself, have you have the game analyze it and so on. And of course, design and develop games is a pretty big business. Um, uh, weirdly enough, um, it's become really big in my hometown of Malmö, um, developing games, and I have nothing to do with it. Maybe it's because I left. I don't know. Um, so these are things that you must do with games. Now, AI classically has very much focused on playing games. So let's look a little bit about this. So video games have been AI test beds and benchmarks for a long time. So we have a couple of games that are um, that all have been used in the main conferences in AI games as benchmarks and test beds. Uh, Starcraft, um, a version of Super Mario Bros. called the Mario, Mario AI benchmark. A racing game called Torx, um, and a um, first. This is Unreal Tournament, first-person shooter. These particular games may be less used these days. The Mario AI benchmark is always around. Some people will still work with StarCraft One, but things have moved on. There's a lot of work with StarCraft Two. There's a lot of work on new racing games, and I've seen a bunch of interesting work on Counter Strike recently. Um, uh, Counter Strike Source. Um, so basically, the idea here is that you come up with an AI that can play any of these games because it is a hard challenge for humans. Oh, wow. Sorry. So let's look at this. I, I, I love showing this video. Um, this video here, I hope you can see it moving as well. We don't know how the screen sharing works, but um, this video here is from the first Mario AI competition that we launched back in 2009. Um, this was because some dude called Marcus Persson, later known as Notch, he also later made a famous game called Minecraft, and then he became weird. Um, but um, I don't know the temporal sequence of this. But um, he um, made this um, freeware version of um, Super Mario Bros. And we, me and my student, adapted this into an AI competition. We thought we had a great AI competition um, until we saw that until this guy, Robin Baumgarten from Imperial College in London, um, submits this bot. And this bot, as you can see, is an amazing Mario player. It's way better than any of us could ever play this game. Um, it's like the pixel perfect landings and the sort of the amazing sort of optimization of everything. You sort of just like cuts through swaths of enemies like it was butter or something. Um, so we were both really excited because this is really great. We were also really sad um, because um, the we, we thought we had a really good AI competition. This guy just comes along and crushes it. And you know what made us even more sad? It's this is 2009. Do you think that this would be some kind of super fancy um, deep neural network algorithm that um, um, uh, that um, solved the game? No. You want to know what it is? It's a star search. I don't know if you've learned about A star in your introductory data um, uh, data structures class. Um, otherwise, you will learn about it in, um, in in your introductory artificial intelligence class. It is look, it's fifteen lines of code. In Java, it's maybe thirty lines of code. Um, it's a simple search algorithm that's been around since the sixties, literally. And what it did was that it didn't search 
in physical space of the game is certain state space and had fast forward models to play the game. And this is kind of shocking. How did it become so good? So next year, we changed the competition to um, and make the level generator generate these overhanging ledges. Um, and you see here, Mario can't really sort of get out of this. Everything Mario needs to go do is to sort of move back left and jump up on the roof of this thing that's stopping him. But the A-star search algorithm can't really handle it. Um, and you see the same thing again. He never searches um, back left. He's just try he just keeps trying to go right. And you see this merry dance. I think there's one later on, which is really fun. Yeah, here is like basically dancing with a spiky guy. Um, amazing micro totally deficient macro. Um, uh, so this is, an, well, of course, we did this specifically to destroy this algorithm. So the winner next year of this Mario AI competition was this algorithm called Realm, or this agent called Realm, which is a complicated bunch of things. Um, I don't know if it's happening here. This is an A star, um, a -star agent at the bottom. Um, that um, executes a rule-based system that decides where to go. And this rule-based system is created in real time by an evolutionary algorithm, um, which is just a lot of stuff going on. You see how we do, Mario does really clever things here um, and plays in a pretty good manner. Um, so you can learn several things about this, uh, from this. One is that the very same game could offer very, very different challenges with small tweaks, such as what levels you play or something else. It also, you can also offer that and, and learn that very often hybrid systems that are not very clean um, really do the job the best. Now, yet another thing you can learn is you can start thinking about, are you really solving the right problem? This is from uh, my former PhD student and postdoc, Nora Shucker. Um, um, she trained a, um, um, she trained an agent based on her five-year-old at the time, niece, on her niece's playing style, um, and um, trained a Bayesian network to be, be able to do like this. And what we used this for was participating in a competition that we organized. We, could, we, we organized this, we were technically outside it, which was called the Mario AI Turing Test, where the whole aim was not playing the game well. It was playing the game in a human-like manner so that people could not tell who was a bot and who was an actual human. Right. So you've seen examples here in the Super Mario Bros, but there's a lot of development of artificial intelligence to play specific games. Um, and you know, you 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 put all your effort into a StarCraft bot or a Super Mario Bros bot or a racing game bot for Torx. The problem is that you know it can't really play any of these bots can't really play any of the other games. Um, this is a long history. This is uh, John McCarthy back in the sixties playing chess. He was one of the one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. Um, and back then, the world was black and white. People wore ties, you know, stuff like this. Computers were the size of a room. I don't know if he won or lost this particular game of chess. Um, and people kept kept working on on chess for a very long time until this happened. This was nineteen ninety seven. Um, IBM's deep blue computer one of Gary Kasparov, um, and this was like one of these big events. Of course, IBM used this very, very cleverly for their, um, for their um, um, marketing, like a computer wins over the best human in the world, um, the best chess player in the world at, at the game, which meant for a long time was considered like the sort of the essence of intelligence. Um, and uh, then uh, people were like um, thinking, um, well, maybe we just chose the wrong um, um, chose the wrong game. Maybe chess isn't that hard. Maybe we should choose another board game. So there was a lot of work and go. Okay, right. Yes, we can look at what happened here. Um, sorry, what happened here? Um, you you would think that you know this this computer that won over the best human in the world at this hard game. Um, does it have some secret source that makes it intelligent? No, it's a version of minimax search. Minimax search basically means that you try all the possible. Um, moves you can make, see where they take you, try possible counter moves. You assume that you want to play the best for you um, uh, and the ad your adversary um, want to play what's worst for me. Um, so one side minimizes, the other maximizes. There's a lots of tricks and, uh, and stuff on this. So, you know, Deep Blue was a huge engineering achievement, but the basic algorithm behind it wasn't any harder than this. 
So people kept working on this, um, and people kept working in Go, which is a um, sort of the East Asian cultural equivalent of chess. It's a very old, um, very old game that um, a board game with quite simple rules and a lot of depth. And here we had a deep mind, then part of Google, their AlphaGo bot winning of Elisa Dahl, one of the world champions in Go, back in 2016. Um, and this was another one, like, you know, huge cultural event, like, wow, we thought that this would actually be a really, really hard game. Um, was AlphaGo, did it have some kind of secret source to intelligence? Um, no, it, it, there is a lot of cleverness in it, but the basic principle is another tree search algorithm. This, this one's called the Monte Carlo tree search. It um, basically uses statistics to um, figure out which kind of possible board state to explore um, next as it simulates playing. It did also had a bunch of deep neural networks that helped it with them um, suggesting interesting moves to try and helped it evaluate board positions and so on. There was a lot of cleverness into this and a lot of engineering, but the basic principle behind it is again, that you're simulating possible games and making these like trees of possible moves in memory. So we see this happening again and again. Um, AI researchers um, set their minds on some problem, for example, playing a particular game really, really, really well, and then they work hard on it, and then they win, and people say that, well, this isn't AI because this is just an algorithm. Wow. Um, car racing, um, uh, I was uh, part of like setting up some of the first um, simulated car racing competitions. Um, uh, in, in, uh, driving a car, as you know, is not that easy. It requires motor control and motor control. Um, it requires planning and adversarial planning to sort of optimize lap times and overtake and so on. Um, uh, this is something that we've known for a long time. Sorry for all the sound on these ones. So we had um, people submitting the best car racing bots to this um, competition server, and then they would drive against each other. Generally, they got very good at driving alone on a track and could do, yeah, that's a question of the new builder, but um, we could do extremely well on their own, but they did not learn in general good road manners, or maybe they were not really rewarded for good road manners. It was trying to sort of, you know, um, use the slipstream to overtake the green car doing fairly well until you get this nasty situation here um i learned to drive on the streets of manhattan so i i mean i can relate to this what's going on here um this here uses something called temporal difference learning which is a reinforcement learning method where you take actions and you observe the reward you get from the environment like um did, did you get punished for driving off road or um did you get um, rewards for driving fast and then it sort of continuously improves um, um, in, in, in improves the agent the actions you take. Right. Um, so this has been going on for a long time. So at some point we asked ourselves, can we construct an AI that can play many games? Like the same literal agent could do could play more than one. Um, because it seems like you can go on and construct very, very good um, AI for playing a particular game without actually making progress on the general intelligence problem. So we, po we postulated this. If you have an agent that can play all the top 100 games on App Store or Steam or something like this, would it then be actually intelligent? Actually, it doesn't make sense to say it's actually intelligent. We created this general video game playing competition um, back then, this is like the software for this is a bit old fashioned. This was originally, it was originally written in Python, but it was too slow. We moved to Java. Um, and the version that um, is, has been widely used is in Java, which a lot of people disagree with, but hey, it's fast. Um, um, the idea here is that we write games in what's called the video game description language. And then every time we run the competition, people submit their best agents. And these agents are tested on a number of, usually 10, unseen games. So you don't know which games you're going to play when you write to the agent. So the agent will have to be general. Um, and the agent, the video game description language is a way of describing, uh, say, late 70s, early 80s era games. 
Um, this is what it looks like. This is a game that's being um, written in this language. Um, it's somewhat Python-like in, um, in its syntax. It says here, these are the things that exist and the properties they have. This is how the level maps to the memory. This is um, what happens like in, in the things like if an avatar um, collides with diamond, then the diamond disappears and the avatar gets two scores or, and so on. And you get a game, well, this is the old sprite set that looks something like this. So let's look at these things happening. This is a, an in VGDL a version of the overworld of the original Zelda. You run around, you, um, well, it's a game inspired by it. We call it Zelda. You run around, you get keys, open doors, um, you kill monsters as a human. Nice. So let's imagine, how would an AI play this? This is, um, let's look at a random player playing this game, doing random actions. It's very bad. It's a random player. It dies quite immediately. Now let's look at something smarter. Um, so we once again go back to Monte Carlo Research, which is the um, agent that was the core of AlphaGo that beat Lisa all at Go. It's a very versatile algorithm. It can do so many things. Um, and here we have a version of Monte Carlo Research playing Zelda. And you see the agent doing really well at killing these monsters getting the key and then they roll out so basically how far it simulates doesn't really see the door because there's a lot of randomness involved but then okay and at some point it actually sees the door and and, and runs there now here is a game called boulder dash um, this is very closely modeled on the actual game called boulder dash which some of you may or may not have played it's an 80s classic unlike many 80s games it really still holds up you have um you need to dig away the dirt to get the diamonds, um, you need to avoid getting smashed in the head with a boulder. You need to also, there's a puzzle element, you need to try to um, not sort of block yourself in by the boulders. Um, and um, because it's very easy to do that. So, um, and you have these monsters here on the side, and the monsters will kill you if you um, uh, reach them. Uh, there's something that looks like a bat in a cave here to the left, and we all know it's 2021. We all know don't disturb the bats in the caves. It's um, um, it's bad for you, bad for the world. And then when you have ten diamonds, you go to the to the exit. Now here's a random player playing Poldodash. Will he do well? He takes random actions. He does not do well. He succumbed to the classic stone in the head. Um, here is the Monte Carlo Research Agent doing this, um, and it's a very sophisticated um, agent. You see how he gets a few diamonds, um, and um, how he behaves like an idiot and gets killed. This is a very hard game. Um, so basically, you see, um, you see, um, uh, you see this agent that actually plays many of the, these games fairly well. Um, this particular agent can win a, a pro approximately half of the 160 games in a framework, um, but there's still some, some that are very, very hard. And this just basically goes to show that, sure, you could make an agent that plays Boulder Dash specifically. It might not even be that hard. The problem is um, one that plays Boulder Dash and all the other games we have in there, versions of uh, Space Invaders and Mario and all kinds of things, and Zelda and stuff. And that's really, 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 really hard. So the general game playing um, problem is really hard. Okay, now on to something completely different. Actually, closely related, but still. So I don't know if any one of you dream, dreams of being a game developer. Um, I'm trying. I'm not trying to dissuade you with this slide. But modern game dev game productions have grown to some huge size because there's just so many things that need to be done, and programming isn't the largest post. There's so much content that need to be created. However, there is, um, for a long time, there's been um, this uh, movement, trend, whatever we call it, of people using procedural content generation games. So here, um, procedural content generation means that some part of the game world is generated by an algorithm, either, um, a, either during development time or during runtime. Um, um, and you see here some of the um, uh, some of the sort of you know um, pioneers. You have Elite here in the background um, and uh, Spelunky. 
then we're going to go uh, mention some of these uh, as we go on and um, <clears throat> and civilization which are all based on like some part of the world is being generated as you play the game and this is like the core of the game in a sense so elite here i used to play elite on my I mean, I got my first Commodore 64 when I was 11. This was 1990, so the machine was already outdated. Um, but I used to play Elite in this machine. Um, Elite is a game where you um, fly around in space. There's 3D renderings of things. These graphics might not might be from the Amiga version, I'm not sure, or it's from the Commodore version, one of them. Um, and there's like um, um, other spaceships, some are just freighters, some are friendly, some are the police, some are pirates, stuff like this. Um, you have lots of stats in your spaceship. Um, there's a huge um, universe with different star system. Each star system has planets, and the planets have space stations um, in some cases around them. Um, and there, the, the, the star chart is enormous, as you can see. 4,096 uh, different um, um, star systems, if I remember right. Um, and each of them has space stations, and you can land at a space station. The space station has different prices for commodities you can buy and sell, and you can trade them to different to other space stations. Um, and so a lot of what happens is trading, but there's also like lots of missions in there. You need to fly and, um, and uh, fly and sort of, um, um, or you can choose to basically carry out various missions. It's enormous, there's so much going on. Um, and this fits in memory in a Commodore 64. Um, a Commodore 64, um, which you may or may not know, had 64 kilobytes of memory. So not gigabytes, not megabytes, kilobytes of memory. 64,000 characters fits in the memory of, of, of this machine. These days, you can easily buy a computer that has a million times as much memory, which is pretty insane when you think about it. Um, how can this possibly fit? How can you fit 4,096 star systems in 64 kilobytes? It seems impossible. Well, the way it works is procedural generation. Every time, you basically, you don't save the star system. You save a number, and every time you get to the star system, and you can look at that particular number, use as a seed for a number of random number generators, which um, are used in a number of algorithms that builds the star system up every time you get there. Rogue is another one. Rogue was created in 1980 by um, uh, Michael Toy and Glenn Wickman at the University of California, Santa Cruz. They wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons on their computer. Um, however, they didn't want to create the, uh, the adventures themselves because that would take a lot of time, and they wanted to, and they didn't want, and they wanted to be surprised. They also didn't have the disk space to save the adventures, so they created this game where with a state of the art graphics here, like this thing here. This is this is you. Um, this is Smiley. Um, you move around and explore these rooms, and you'd encounter dragons and different monsters. You can get find treasures, you can find the various weapons and things with status effects, magic potions and stuff like this. And every time the thing is generated, every time you start the game. So no two playthroughs are the same. This, of course, started a whole genre of roguelikes, which um, are ever popular and more popular than ever. Um, I spent a lot of the spring and summer playing Hades, for example, which is sort of a light roguelike, a roguelite. But this idea of like the world is regenerated every time you play it. Diablo 3 is another example of roguelike. Spelunky, roguelike platformer, um, um, made a huge sort of um, effect on the indie game community back in 2008. Civilization games, they are also like, in a sense, roguelikes. Um, you need. In core to the, to the whole game series, that you need to um, um, you need to have a new game, a new sort of world to explore every time you start playing. No Man's Sky, which some of you may have um, played, um, some of you may have heard of, probably everyone. Um, it's a uh, hugely divisive. It is a fantastic art piece, um, maybe not a fantastic game, but it is basically a lead for the twenty first century with. Um, uh, every every planet has its own flora and fauna and uh, and things like this. It sort of lacks in overall narrative structure, but it has um, it's an amazing world generator in there, and it has more planets than than you could ever um, um, than you could ever sort of um, uh, ex um, uh, visit in a lifetime. Um, the same idea. Everything is uh, you store you store certain random seeds, and when you actually encounter that sort of planet. The planet is recreated from those random seeds. 
So I've been concerned a lot with how could you bring procedural content generation further? Could you um, cut game development time? Um, uh, oh, I see someone in chat saying it's in a redemption now um, uh, in No Man's Sky. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I want to actually restart it. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's something I want to do and sort of, you know, see what it's like now in 2021. Anyway, so procedural content generation, could you sort of help help creating games, making it possible to create games with smaller um, um, smaller sort of team sizes because you can just wave your hands and create things? Can you create games that adapt the game world to the preference of the player? Can you create endless games that you never want to stop playing and that, that actually meaningfully sort of, you know, keep keeping different? Not like the infinite worlds of Minecraft or something. Um, could you even circumvent or augment the limits of our human creativity and create new types of games? And another one for people who study games is a very relevant one. Could you understand game design better through formalizing the design process? So if you're a computer scientist, you know that you won't, don't really understand sorting until you've written a sorting algorithm. So do you really understand game design before you've written a game design algorithm? Um, this is a controversial algorithm. Once I repeat said this argument in a little bit longer form in the front of like a few hundred game studies kind of people, and they were angry at me. I think it's fascinating, um, but, but, but you know, enlightening. So if we look at Super Mario Bros that we've used before, um, we looked at before, um, and I see I need to speed up because I need to be done in 10 minutes at the most. Um, um, you could yeah, generate levels in lots of different ways. One thing I've worked a lot with is this thing called evolutionary computation, where you basically mimic artificial evolution in an algorithm. So you basically have lots of different solutions, in this case, lots of different uh, Super Mario Bros. levels, and you make um, mutations and crossover of these and sort of find new ones that sort of um, um, uh, 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 and, and keep the good ones, discard the bad ones. In the end, you get better and better. You climb the fitness landscape. So here is some work I did in what, my, PhD, my, my PhD student back in Malmö, Steve Dahlskog. Miriam was actually on his PhD committee. Um, we divided up the, um, um, uh, the sort of um, levels into a number of different slices or columns, as we call them here. Here is like slice one, slice two, Sli no, slice one, slice one again, slice two, slice one again, and here's slice three. So you sort of um, can, can turn a level into a string. And then we evaluated this. The fitness function was how many different design patterns are in these levels. And then you can pretty quickly learn to generate a whole bunch of different um, levels um, this way. And you get like this infinite level generator. It's really fast, and it has... Um, a lot of local patterns, maybe not so much in, in terms of global patterns, but you can control that as well. This is this idea has also been used by others. So um, um, this is some work by Cameron Brown, um, who is at Maastricht now. He was at the University of Queensland before, um, and he he generated completely new board games. So he had his population, including the rules of different board games. These like um, things like Go, Gomoku. Um, checkers, uh, Chinese chess, um, four in a row, and so on. You select parents from these, cross over, mutate, check the rules. If the game is not well formed, so for example, there's no win condition, you throw it away. Give it a name. He had this like name generator, which was Lord of the Rings inspired. Check if it um, is too slow to play, if that you throw it away. Otherwise, you optimize a game playing agent to play it. It's based on Minimax, but you evolve in neural networks. If it always leads to draw, you throw it away. Otherwise, if it's inbred, too similar in how it plays to other games, it's, um, um, you throw it away. Otherwise, you evaluate it in the evaluation function. There's a lot of um, different things that are tested. For example, how late in this game can you tell who's going to win is one of the core things. And then it's put back in the population. And you ran this for a long time. Um, and one of the things that came out was this game Yavalath, which, where you basically need to, this is the description of Yavalath. You win if you have four in a row, 
but you lose if you have three in a row. So it's a complicated version of four, of four in a row, essentially. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, let me see. You can buy it boxed. Um, Cameron has actually made some money from selling this game. <clears throat> and it says here that Yavalat is not designed by Ludi. Ludi is a system that, or not, not designed by Cameron Brown, but it's designed by Cameron Brown's Ludi. Ludi is a system he, he built that designed the game. So Cameron Brown did not design this game. Cameron Brown designed the software that designed this game. However, Cameron is selling it. Cameron is getting all the money and his software is not getting any of the money. Discuss. Well, it's, it's fun. I think it's really fun that you see um, um, this is a complete game that's completely designed by an evolutionary algorithm. Now, I'm almost done here. I'm just going to mention a few more little things here. Um, there's a lot of work in designing levels, but you can also design levels. How can you collaborate with a, a content generator? So this here is a game that was popular maybe seven years ago or so on mobile called Cut the Rope. I guess it's still out there. You basically, it's a physics-based puzzle game where you have to feed this little frog monster candy by pushing um, the candy around, cutting ropes when you need to, and so on. And here's a system that um, we built called Rope Awesome, um, where you, which can generate new levels for this game. Um, you press a button and it generates a new level. It's based on grammatical evolution, so an evolutionary algorithm um, that interacts with the grammar system. Um, you can also decide it yourself. Um, you can sort of put things out here as you would with any kind of WYSIWYG designer. Um, uh, here's cushions that the candy will bounce off. And then you can put like an air cushion here um, and uh, a bubble that will catch um, the, um, the candy and so on. And it's a rocket. And then you can check, you can ask it, please system, can you play it for me? And it tries to play it. And it tells you, you see here as it plays around, it has all the different sort of um, actions you need to take up here and it can help you analyze what you're building by playing it as you sort of um, and you see what's possible what's not possible it can tell you if it's un not possible it can view the actions of that it takes this is basically what the um, grammar based system produces um, um, and you, then you can tell it that okay i want to keep some of these things and i want you the system to redesign the rest so here we um, redesign the rest of the level. It turns out that this is a very boring level because it basically you just cut all of the ropes at the same time and you win. So you do another one, um, and um, and you have it optimize the design, and it gives you a pro so, sort of surprising one. How would you play this level? Well, it turns out that if you um, if you load the rope. Um, lo load the candy onto the rocket and cut the it rope at the right time. Um, the um, the, ro um, uh, the candy will actually bounce off this uh, bouncy thing. So it basically the system shows you un um, it shows you sort of you know surprising solutions to the um, uh, to the levels you're designing, among other things. Um, Last thing I want to tell you, I have no time to go into this. There's also a lot of AI work in modeling what players do and what players feel. So this is some work that was done for a long time ago, and there's been lots of follow-up work to this, where we tried to, this is the same good old Mario AI framework. We tried to um, teach neural networks. We had people play this game, play different levels, and see which of these two levels was most fun, which was most frustrating which was most challenging. And then we could model how a particular playing style would think about a particular level. And then you can optimize. You can search the neural network for levels that are maximally frustrating and minimally fun. No, 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 the other way around. Maximally fun, minimally frustrating, or whatever you want to. I'm probably way over time. So here, here's what, how I think it all relates. Video games are perfect tests for AI. They vary, the cheap, the better than robots. They're designed to challenge the mind. I didn't even get into that argument why games are great for challenging the minds. General video game playing is important. Playing not one game, but a lot of them. Um, but also, AI is the future of game design. So basically, you can use for testing games, 
generating content together with humans on its own, generating tutorials, um, and so on. So um, you already, I wrote this popular science book, which might be a fun read for some people. And I think Miriam has already told you about this artificial intelligence games book, which is nicely available online. We also run a summer school every summer, um, which is connected to this book. And I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Julian. What an expose. Uh, thank you so much. And let's uh, give a big hand to Julian. I'm going, to, I'm going to stop the recording so that I can turn the camera around so that you can see the audience and, and, and they can ask you questions. So uh, with that, I'm now stopping the recording here. Um, and uh, so to you who are looking at a later recording, Goodbye for now. So record.